Hello and welcome to my artistic interpretation of Indian Education by Sherman Alexie. Sherman Alexie is a Spokane Coeur d'Alene writer and many of his short stories focus on the exploration of the modern Native American experience. Indian Education is about a Native American boy named Victor and his grade school education on and off the Spokane Reservation where he lived. Victor's voice throughout the story is beautifully written and lends itself to the discussion of many themes, such as systematic racial oppression, bullying, eating disorders, alcoholism, and suicide. The story is sad and almost hopeless because it really captures the limitations imposed upon Native American peoples living on reservations. When reading the story, you might get a sense of inevitability or even futility because although the characters in the story are young, we see them succumb to the same challenges that the previous generations of Native Americans faced. The story does, however, offer readers a thread of hope. Throughout the tale, we see Victor struggle with his ethnic identity, forsaking it and reclaiming it from one section to the next. Joining him on this journey of self-discovery and pride is a very meaningful experience. So let's go through it together. The story is divided into 13 sections, one for every year of Victor's grade schooling and one for his class reunion. I have created 13 illustrations to correspond with all of these sections using a combination of art markers and watercolor pencils. So let's stop at each image and discuss Alexi's work. The story starts with Victor in the first grade experiencing bullying by the other Native American students on the reservation. Here's a short passage from that section. I was always falling down. My Indian name was Junior Falls Down. Sometimes it was Bloody Nose or Steal His Lunch. Once it was Cries Like a White Boy, even though none of us had seen a white boy cry. At the end of the section, Victor finds himself singled out by one of the worst bullies. One day, something in Victor snaps, and as he describes it, a little warrior comes out, and Victor starts beating up the bully until he is bleeding. The bully lies in the snow covered in blood and Victor is taken to the principal's office chanting, it's a good day to die. Now, one of the most obvious tensions in this section is the violence. We see children age six, presumably, using excessive force against each other, beating each other up, causing each other to bleed. So we can tell that this is an environment that is defined by struggle. Another component in this section is the racial element. Right off the bat, we have Victor's bullies calling him cries like a white boy. They insult Victor by comparing him to the privileged race, and in doing so, they mock the privileged race. Interestingly, we can tell from Victor's narration that the Native American students in the story are actually not very well acquainted with any white students at this point. This section also contains the rare appearance of a non-English term, the term top yo yacht, which Victor translates to weakling, is presumably in the language spoken by the Spokane Native Americans. At this point in Victor's life, white people are more likely to be at the periphery of his awareness. He is immersed in Native American culture. We see this immersion demonstrated especially in the awakening of Victor's little warrior. In the second grade, Victor has a cruel and racist missionary teacher. Although he's a bright student, she seems to single him out, making him apologize for doing nothing wrong and doling out various punishments. For instance, one day she made him stand for 15 minutes while holding two very heavy books. At the end of the second section, the missionary teacher tells Victor's parents that he has to cut his braids. I'd like to read the final passage from that section. Quote, 
My parents came in the next day and dragged their braids across Betty Towell's desk. Indians, Indians, Indians. She said it without capitalization. She called me Indian, Indian, Indian. And I said, yes, I am. I am Indian. Indian, I am. When his teacher repeats the term Indian, you can tell that she's saying it in a spiteful way, especially because Victor says that she says it without capitalizing it. So it's not a proper noun to her so much as an insult, a nuisance. But when Victor replies, he does it in italics, and the term Indian is capitalized. He's acknowledging and taking pride in the fact that, hey, he is Indian. That is indeed the description of who he is. In the third section, Victor jokes that he creates his first traditional Native American portrait, which is of a stick figure peeing in his backyard. As punishment, his teacher makes him stand in the corner facing the wall. The last two lines of the section read, I stood alone in the corner, faced the wall, and waited for the punishment to end. I'm still waiting. There's a line break before that last line, I'm still waiting. From that powerful line, we realize that Victor is actually an older narrator looking back. In fact, he might be narrating as an adult because another line from this section reads, Censorship, I might cry now. Freedom of expression, I would write in editorials to the tribal newspaper. It would seem that Victor, much like his author, grew into a writer who engages with his Native American community. In the fourth grade, Victor's teacher tells him that he should become a doctor so that he can heal his tribe. Already aware that his tribe needs lots of healing, the child starts daydreaming of being Dr. Victor. This section paints a vivid image of Victor's parents, the alcoholic father and the restless mother. Here's an interesting line from this section. They sat in separate dark places in our HUD house and wept savagely. HUD stands for Housing and Urban Development. It's a department of the United States government. So we get this image of a desperate family living in low-income housing under the weight of oppression. It's very interesting to note that Victor describes his parents as weeping savagely and he later uses the term Indian tears. Savage is a derogatory term used by colonists who landed in the United States to describe the Native Americans they encountered. The term Indian tears likely refers to the Trail of Tears, the historical forced removal of Native Americans from their home by the United States government. By using such terms, Alexi demonstrates to his readers that Victor's family is struggling through burdens that are unique to the Native American experience. In the fifth grade, Victor throws a basketball for the first time in his life, and even though he misses, he's intrigued by the way it feels in his hands and all the possibilities it offers. Meanwhile, his cousin gets high off of rubber cement and is intrigued by the way it makes him see the world. The last line in the section reads, Oh, do you remember those sweet, almost innocent choices that the Indian boys were forced to make? This section seems to offer readers a dichotomy. On the one hand, Victor's cousin was almost forced to get high because he was looking for escape. On the other hand, Victor was forced to feel the weight of his own potential in his hands. And even though he failed on his very first try, he describes the feeling of that basketball in his hands as beautiful. In the sixth grade, Victor befriends Randy, a new Native American student who lived in a predominantly white town. As soon as Randy arrives at the reservation school, he gets in a fight with a white student who calls him a racial slur. As Randy and the bully face off, the bully keeps telling Randy to throw the first punch, and Randy keeps refusing until, upon the third request, he breaks the bully's nose. The final line from this section reads, 
That was Randy, my soon-to-be first and best friend, who taught me the most valuable lesson about living in the white world. Always throw the first punch. I think the interpretation of this last line is up for debate. Technically speaking, Randy did throw the first punch, but the bully literally asked for it, and he was the one who started the fight. For these reasons, I think it's fair to interpret that last line as an endorsement of the use of violence in self-defense. That last line can also be taken as advice for people to take every opportunity that's offered to them to stand up for themselves. The lesson learned here might be to not be submissive in the face of conflict, but rather to fight. It's been five years now since Victor's little warrior first emerged, but he's still got his work cut out for him. In the seventh grade, Victor kisses a white girl, and with that kiss, he feels as though he is saying goodbye to his entire Native American heritage. This goodbye is presented as bittersweet. On the one hand, he feels as though he has lost his tribe. On the other hand, kissing a white girl offers him the hope that he will one day be able to escape the difficulties of life on a reservation. This sense of escapism is expressed in the following passage. I kissed that white girl and when I opened my eyes, she was gone from the reservation. And when I opened my eyes, I was gone from the reservation living in a farm town where a beautiful white girl asked my name. But his sense of loss is reiterated in the hilarious final line of the section, which reads, After that, no one spoke to me for another 500 years. The beginning of the section has a much darker tone as the white girl is introduced as the white girl who would later be raped by her foster parent father, who was also white. But Victor makes no comment on the rape, likely because the horrific and extremely sad nature of the situation speaks for itself. Victor instead turns his attention back to race, pointing out that when the rape story ran in the papers, the headlines neglected to mention that the victim and the attacker were white, although they made sure to mention that they lived on a reservation. Another passage from this section reads, just Indians being Indians, someone must have said somewhere, and they were wrong. This section is the first to highlight racial oppression at the hands of the media. Beyond more direct forms of racial oppression, the majority race is able to subjugate the minority by taking control of and rewriting their narrative. In the eighth grade, Victor attends a school off-reservation in a nearby farm town populated by many white people. Many of the white girls at this middle school suffer from eating disorders. Victor relates their bulimia to his dad's hungover vomiting. The act of retching in this section might be symbolic of the regurgitation and perpetuation of society's flaws. These flaws take their toll on the people both physically and emotionally. And not even white people are immune. If one part of society is sick, then the whole body suffers. At one point, Victor tells a white girl, give me your lunch if you're just going to throw it up. On the reservation, food is scarce, and what little they do have is of very poor nutritional quality. As Victor says, even the dogs wouldn't eat it. It's fascinating to see the juxtaposition between the starvation of the privileged girls and the starvation of the Native Americans. The girls are held back by their own minds, whereas the Native Americans face physical scarcity. Yet both groups suffer, and Victor describes both groups as growing skinny from self-pity. The final line in this section reads, There is more than one way to starve. In the ninth section, Victor begins high school, which is still off reservation and in that same farm town where he went to middle school. One day during a school dance, Victor faints. His friends take him to the emergency room and he finds out that he has diabetes, which statistically Native Americans tend to be more susceptible to than members of other ethnic groups. But before the diagnosis, his friends wake him up on the dance floor and a teacher runs up to them and says, 
Hey, what's that boy been drinking? I know all about these Indian kids. They start drinking real young. Now, there is a very interesting detail that has to be pointed out about this situation. Victor's friends are white, and his teacher is Chicano. The final line of this section reads, Sharing dark skin doesn't necessarily make two men brothers. Victor's disappointment is evident. The Chicano teacher has taught him a very difficult lesson. Sometimes the people you most expect to be able to empathize with your situation disappoint you the most. On the day of the school dance, Victor's friends were his true family, regardless of their race. Another fascinating component of the ninth section is the passing mention of Victor's increasing success in basketball. All of the potential that Victor felt in the weight of the basketball in his hands in the fifth grade it turns out he has made become into a beautiful reality. His admirable success through hard work makes his teacher's prejudice seem even more foolish. Do Indian boys start drinking real young teacher? Or do they grow into spectacular young men? In the 10th grade, Victor gets his driver's license. On that same day, a Native American man from Victor's reservation a man with a family and a career, drives his car into a tree. When the state trooper discovers that the man had no alcohol in his blood when he died, he asks Victor and his fellow Native Americans why they think he might have committed suicide. No one has an answer for the state trooper, but according to Victor, the suicide makes sense to everyone in the crowd. The weight of the historical and lasting oppression suffered by every single tribe is a burden on each individual Native American. To have to carry in one's background, one's very identity, that kind of wildly unjust imposed disadvantage day after day and generation after generation. For some people, it can feel like too much. Even though everything had been going seemingly well in that man's life, it was as though he wasn't free. He still wasn't free, and he could never be so long as he lived in such a society. The last line of this section reads, Believe me, everything looks like a noose if you stare at it long enough. Here we see the theme of escapism returning in a much darker form. Everyone is looking for a way out, and we can only pray that they choose struggle over death. In the 11th grade, Victor causes his basketball team to lose a high-stakes game. This section is very emotionally powerful because basketball has been Victor's one thread of hope throughout his story up until now. To add even more insult to his beloved hobby and talent, the team Victor plays for is called the Indians. As Victor puts it, he's, quote, probably the only actual Indian ever to play for a team with such a mascot. The rest of Victor's team is presumably white and blissfully unaware of what it feels like to have one's ethnicity be made into a caricature. In the real world, we have many such teams. Famously, the Washington Redskins have to this day refused to change their name. They deny the persistent requests of multiple Native American tribes in favor of not inconveniencing their fans. Some of us might not realize how insulting their mascot actually is simply because we're used to it. They've been called the Washington Redskins for as long as we can remember. But think about what that actually means. How can the white and black men who play for the team claim to represent Native Americans? How can they justify using a derogatory term for Native Americans in this day and age? Since most mascots are animals, are they putting Native Americans on the same level as animals? The utter lack of respect for Native Americans as a group of human beings is evident in one's comfort with making the decision to represent Native Americans as mascots, reducing their identity and their rich heritage to a mere symbol a symbol of largely white entertainment, no less. 
The last two lines of this section are breathtakingly evocative. This morning, I pick up the sports page and read the headline, Indians lose again. Go ahead and tell me none of this is supposed to hurt me very much. His contrarian wording implies that people have told him many times before to simply get over the numerous microaggressions he's suffered through. Indians lose again. Folks tell him he's being too sensitive. Indians lose again. Folks tell him it's just a game. Indians lose again. The twelfth section is split into two parts which are meant to be compared and contrasted. The first part is about Victor's graduation from his farm town high school, and the second part is about the graduation of his fellow Native Americans back on the reservation. Our beloved protagonist is the valedictorian, and he has been awarded scholarships for his intellect and perseverance. Like his name states, he is indeed a victor. Meanwhile, at the reservation graduation, we learn that a few of the graduating students are still illiterate. The last line from the part about Victor's graduation reads, I try to remain stoic for the photographers as I look toward the future. The last line from the part about the reservation graduation reads, They smile for the photographer as they look back toward tradition. The final line of the entire section reads, The tribal newspaper runs my photograph and the photograph of my former classmates side by side. These graduating students have taken such divergent life paths, yet the author is inviting us to compare them with each other. Victor is clearly more successful than his counterparts, but we can tell from the writing that he might be less happy at the very least, he is a bit less in touch with his Native American heritage. He is not a man among his people, but a minority, cursed and blessed to forge a new path for his people. We can take heart in the fact that he does so proudly, because Victor describes his cap as ill-fitting, since his hair has never been longer. Meanwhile, although Victor's fellow Native Americans back on the reservation are among their tribe, they have clearly been given serious disadvantages with regards to their education. Victor's narrative has officially diverged dramatically from that of your average Native American student. An all too rare success story, Victor will now bravely venture forth, fighting for his tribe. We know from the third section that Victor ends up becoming a writer and an activist. I suspect that his story largely mirrors that of his author, Sherman Alexi, who is also a Spokane Native American. After reading this tale, my respect for Victor and Alexi both is immense. I know how hard it is to fight for one's people, and also how important. I am an Iraqi Muslim woman living in the United States. I have faced racism and Islamophobia, both at the personal level and institutionally. So many Muslims have been hurt in this time period that I decided to become a voice for them. I too am a writer and an activist, and my cause is to fight ignorance with knowledge and to spread peace in the face of violence. The world has so much darkness to offer, but I believe that that darkness has been doomed from the start. It doesn't stand a chance against compassion. Victor's commitment to his tribe will take him and his people and the entire nation a very long way. Indians won't lose again because they have a victor to lead them. Now, there is a 13th section to this story, but it's only two lines long and it's titled Postscript Class Reunion. It reads, quote, Victor said, why should we organize a reservation high school reunion? My graduating class has a reunion every weekend at the Pow Wow Tavern. Several elements about this section are strange. First of all, you might have noticed from my quotes throughout this video 
that the entire story up until now has been written in the first person from Victor's point of view and in the present tense. This section, on the other hand, is written in the third person, referencing Victor as a character rather than the narrator, and it's written in the past tense. The resulting effect is very jarring and distancing. It's almost sad because suddenly readers realize that they are no longer in Victor's mind. They are no longer given access to his thoughts. It's time for them to let him go. Secondly, I'd like to point out that Victor refers to his graduating class, but his graduating class isn't the reservation high school student body because he didn't attend the reservation high school. The implication here is a rather positive one. Although Victor didn't graduate with his fellow Native Americans from the reservation, he still keeps in touch with them regularly. Their community is strong. Although he attended a different high school, he refers to the reservation high school student body as we. At the same time, from his wording, it seems as though his graduating class has drinks every weekend without him. He doesn't include himself in that statement, which can give the reader hope that Victor hasn't fallen into the same old trap. Alcoholism is a big problem on many reservations, and Victor's own father struggled with it. We don't know how much time has passed in this epilogue-like section, but we do know that Victor ends up becoming a leader for his community. This ending is bittersweet because on the one hand, we see the community together, they love each other and support each other. They have no need for a high school reunion because their bond is so strong, they are always together. On the other hand, they're all meeting at the tavern, which could have negative implications judging by the way in which alcohol has been portrayed in this story and by the way that alcohol has impacted many Native American communities. There is still optimism to be drawn, however. Yes, the ending is realistic in showing that there are still problems, but we also know that we have many people who love each other and are willing to fight them. Thank you so much for watching my video. Go read Sherman Alexie's work. Increase in your knowledge. Engage always in your community. Never stop fighting against oppression and spread the love.